Um, I, I just, just to stick in the back of your head, and it's a slight non sequitur as you were talking about teaching people technology literacy. Um, what's our only success functionally in the last decade of getting Americans to actually exercise? We've spent hundreds of billions. This is somewhat of a trick question, and he, may, he already knows the answer. Um, it was gamification. It was Pokemon Go. I know that sounds absurd, but if you actually look at the data, Pokemon Go did more to get people out chasing the little, and we've often had this running discussion, what would happen if that type of technology is saying, here's how I train you how to understand how to work chat GPT. The gamification of even down to healthcare and maintaining if um, drug adherence is 16% of all US healthcare when I forget to take my statin, when I don't do those things. How do I make it so my pill bottle cap beeps at me, or those sorts of things. That there are solutions that are genuinely ahead of us, and we're actually struggling saying, is there a unified theory of the ability to use this technology disruption? When I call the IRS, the person I'm talking to is actually a chat GPT, but it stays on the phone with me, and it helps me fill out my forms, and then maybe texts me the form I need instead of someone who's been dealing with crazy for f seven hours and doesn't really want to be on the phone with me. Um, and that's actually going on right now. And so far, the early data of the IRS experiment of using a chatbot has been apparently really good. That's human. So if it be from the cures to the education to the you know, miracles of producing new um, materials. And, I'm, and we're trying to help us sort of build the, the argument that you know, many of us aren't that bright, but we get to sit here and um, read things that smart people write for us. But how do we create a unified theory of let the technology run? Because God forbid, none of us truly know what it's going to look like a few years from now. I mean, Mr. am I being Ch fair? Richard Chairman, will, will you yield for question? I thought you were going to tell us it was pickleball um, <laughs> rather than. You know I don't like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I tried one pickleball and my eight-year-old beat me. Um, I mean, could, could I just uh, wholeheartedly endorse uh, what Dr. Howard had to say about uh, digital literacy, AI literacy, because this is really important. First of all, Representative Rochester has a really nice bill on, on uh, digital AI literacy that I think we should take a look at. That's really good stuff. Um, and when we talk about this, you know, AI literacy, digital literacy, we're talking about, you know, learning for life. You know, no matter what kind of uh, punches come at us, we can roll with those punches and figure out how to adapt when we know more about the technology. It's about building resiliency, societal and individual resiliency. And, you know, people sometimes laugh at this. I was on a, uh, I was a co-chair of an uh, uh, Obama administration online safety and security task force where like the only thing anybody in the room could agree on was the importance of digital etiquette and literacy. Uh, so there's a lot of agreement on this. This is a good place to start. It's a good foundation for building that resiliency. Um, and some people will say, well, that's not enough. Okay, fine, we'll find other remedies, but it can go a long way. You know, I'm old enough to remember the problems we had in this country with littering and forest fires back in the 60s and 70s. And I remember well, I'm sure some of you up there too uh, as well, that, you know, give a hoot, don't pollute. We addressed that, right? We, we went after Woodsy, you know, Woodsy the Owl and things like that with Smokey the Bear and forest fires. We, we made a huge difference just with societal education about the problems of littering and forest fires, right? That wasn't a law that passed. That, that was actual societal learning. It was wrong to throw things out your window of your car, right? So you apply that mentality to the world of like digital and AI policy, and we talk about, again, AI etiquette, netiquette, if you will, like proper behavior, using algorithmic services and technologies, using LLMs, using, you know, well, these systems. Yes, I, I, I want to go, for, and actually, I, I also want uh, Mr. Byer to comment on this. And, you know, you teach students, you already have, you have to deal with lots of freaky smart people, most of them bathe, I assume. Um, that's actually really funny if you know some of her scientists. Um, how do I deal with my brothers and sisters here who aren't Don Byer, who are almost fearful of the technology? Um, I mean, you know, what do we do to take away, I mean, I, I swear they, they, they instantly think of a Terminator movie. I mean, what do you do? I mean, in healthcare, I can't tell you the, I'm going to forgive my elegance and my language, the crap I take when I basically say the same things you have at forms of my, here's my healthcare costs, here's things we could do to disrupt it using technology. And I will get administrators and this and that that come and say, well, we can't do that. 
it might be against our state law. So technology allows us to operate at a higher level. I have a terrible sense of direction, right? So I use Google Maps and Uber and Lyft to get places. I don't pick up a rotary phone and call my friends to ask for directions and write them down on a notepad, right? That the norm after you look it up in the phone book. Right. Yeah. I, I don't even have a don't even have a phone book in the house anymore. And you know, my iPhone organizes my calendar and email and tells me where to go and what to do because I'm a little absent minded. And that's the the standard, like that's the standard of my day. And I think if we make that analogy over to healthcare, where right now we have the rotary phone and we actually uh, single-handedly keep the fax machine lobby employed, um, we have an opportunity to totally transform that. So the the clinical example is like if your blood pressure is really low and you have septic shock and you're going to the ICU and you're getting pressors, you have to stick some big IV in your neck. Uh, 30 years ago, if they, they did that, they'd just look at anatomical landmarks and put the, put the IV in and, and hope that you know, they didn't hit your carotid artery, which would be bad. Now, you, you use ultrasound. You do ultrasound guided. You have a little probe, and you take a look. And if you tried to do it the other way, the nurse would run, run screaming into the room telling you that you're about to be negligent and doing something bad. And the, anal the, the answer here is, is that technology will allow us to do a safer, more effective job. It will become the standard. And at some point, to actually not use technology will be negligent. You get the last. Um, well, first of all, on your comment on gamification, I wanted to show you, David, that I'm on day 643 on Duolingo. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> uh, and that's only because of gamification. And, but, but, and, but it makes my point. And it will ring at 11.30 you... at night if I forgot to do it. So. Oh, so that's what I want from pill bottle caps when you don't take your statin. Right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Carioso, uh, I was very impressed with all of that you, your testimony, but especially the notion that scientific machine learning, Sandy is fusing machine learning with scientific principles to solve scientific and engineering problems. Um, for me, that is maybe the most exciting part of AI, not, not chat GPT-4 or 5 or 6 or 7, but the notion that everything from fusion energy to how our biology works, et cetera, et cetera, that you can use machine learning, the, pres the predictive parts of AI to figure things out. Can, can you expand on that as a scientist? I would love to. Thank you for the question. You know, I think, to me, this is this is the really exciting potential, right? I mean, ChatGPT has shown us how it can change our daily interactions. And, you know, I was able to put my written testimony into our internal chat engine and ask it if it was, you know, helping me make it a little less technical and more general. And it was great for providing me with a first draft in editing. But that's just been trained on the corpus of knowledge that's in the internet. I think. What I get really excited about is the transformative potential of training models on science data so that I have my chemist intern with me that can help me discover new science properties that can then help me think through the physics and thermal and mechanical stresses to design a part that can be manufactured today, right? We can just go from a new material to something that can be in our hands and usable and transform not just how we do medicine, and how we interact with patients, but how we make things in the country. And so AI has the potential if we do it and we constrain it with science so that these concepts of hallucination and statistically guessing what the next answer should be based on what is learned, we can constrain that with physics and chemistry and science data. We can then do new manufacturing. We can make digital twins of the human body to take the drug discovery from decades down to months maybe 100 days for the next vaccine. Mr. Byer, anything follow up? Um, no, but I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing that. And I, I, one of the things we don't talk about much is, um, as somebody who ran a small business for many, many years, the notion that one of the most important technologies is management. Um, we don't tend to think of it that way. But the way we can, the way we can explore the use of artificial intelligence to make management much better and management decisions much better. Once again, to the issue of making our world much more efficient, dealing with the $100,000 per second that we borrow. 
And if we're lucky, we'll replace members of Congress with something intelligent. <laughs> Never mind. Um, or, or raise our oh, pay. Right. And they've called votes on, for us on the House oh, side. Oh. So um, can, can, we, I, can I ask one more question then? Will it be short? Yeah. yeah. You sure? I'm positive. Okay. Dr. Howard, <laughs> you, you started Zyrobotics. Um, and you also made, what's it say, um, STEM tools and learning games for children with diverse learning needs. Yes. Um, I, I'd love, you know, the, the chair of our AI task force, uh, Jay Mc, Obernolte, Dr. Obernolte, machine learning masters from Caltech, so sort of a smart guy. Um, and he made his fortune in, in video games. Um, I'd love to get your insight into how we use gaming um, to help educate people. Um, on not just artificial intelligence, but on everything else in the science world. Well, with Zy Robotics, I could get five-year-olds to learn how to code through gamification. And so, and it, it really is, is how do you provide small nuggets based on someone's knowledge, engaging with them, and bring them along, scaffold them along, to at the end, they're like, oh, I'm actually putting code together to do simple things for a five-year-old. Um, I think that could be done with adults as well. Yeah, I'd love to work with you. I have a couple of ideas, which, which we go offline with. But, yeah. but David, thank and you so you, much, he, Mr. He, Chairman. He, and he knows that's actually one of my fixations. So you're, it's, well, there's a reason I like you. Um, thank you for engaging in this hearing with us. Um, you be prepared. You have we're going for three days. We may ask you questions. I am going to ask also to do something a little bit different for the public record. If you have articles that you think would be appropriate for us to try to absorb. In reality, we're gonna make our staff read it and then give us the highlighted copy. Um, please send it our direction. And with that,